Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Success Thursday this week with Kier Lamsden. Hey, Kier, welcome back. Hello, happy Thursday! What a week Absolutely. it's been. Yeah, and it it uh, yeah it just flew by, right? Uh, it's also my first week uh, back to work, so that's, that's slightly painful. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. All right, but let's go to the topic. Uh, success Thursday is, of course, where we reflect on what success means for us as Scrum Masters. But before we go there, let's talk about something we use in order to try to reach that success. I'm talking about Agile Retrospective. So, Kier, share with us, what's your favorite retrospective format and why? I'm I'm debating as to whether to give the flippant answer, but um, (laughs) um, the the one that creates conversation about the area of focus um, and uh, ultimately exposes an idea, um, I know that 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 does sound flippant, um, but I guess understanding the context of the team, understanding the individuals in the team and understanding those who are happy to jump in and those who are less keen is going to lead you to understand what is going to be the most impactful retrospective at that point. Um, Do I need to use something like the fishbowl format where there is opportunity for fewer people to be actively involved uh, and make it a more focused conversation? Um, Because that might bring those with some anxieties about confrontation into it if they have fewer people to be talking to um or can i look to create a situation where i just ask a a relevant question um follow with an open question and then let the rest happen just like the blue touch paper um i think you can fall victim to using a format because you like it rather than because it does the thing you need it to um that said there's lots of formats that are ultimately different ways of asking the same question um so you can be free to to pick and choose. I will say the one I've used on many occasions is a variation around the Covey circles of influence um, because I've seen teams start to have real problems if they focus on all the things they can't change rather than focusing on the things they can. Um, So you can see teams start to wallow in sort of despair sometimes at this point. Um, So bringing the focus back to things that they can do something about and can actively, um, well, I suppose, actively put in place in their very next sprint is, a, is something that's really, really powerful for a retrospective. That is the point, after all. So I think, in this sense, I think you can use that in every single retro to help focus the t- team on the things they've agreed on um, and the things they've agreed they can do something about. So even if you choose to use another retro format, I would suggest using the, the Covey circles of influence to say, okay, well, right. What are the things we can actively do something about right now? Um, so that we're not worrying about these things in the, in the sort of soup, the area of concern. Um, cause that's feeding a so, Kaizen so mentality. The, the goal is also to, uh, let the team express what's on their mind, but not let them, and I, I guess you meant not let them dwell yeah. on what might be on their mind, and it's heard and it's documented, but they can't do anything about, right? Yeah, because you, you want to you want to build a um, this kaizen mentality of um, understanding the bigger issues and hi- still highlighting them, so not not ignoring them, but not letting them act as a crutch and stopping you from improving. Um, so it's, it's, it's be aware of them, highlight them, see if you can Im- influence them, but also um, be clear about the things you can do something immediately about. Absolutely, because if we can't influence, we should just forget about it and then move on and try to do something. And, and it's a little bit like what we were talking about yesterday, right? Like change doesn't happen in a PowerPoint presentation. Change happens on the day-to-day actions that we take. And the same thing with improvement right like we might have 20 different things we could do but if we can only work on one well let's start there because you never know what might work but as you start you get more insights you get more inspiration and and of course you might even find things that you can influence and have an impact absolutely you never know what you might learn from doing that one thing 
<laughs> and uh, uh, in the spirit of you never know, uh, I wanted to ask another question. Of course, we always know what success is in retrospect, but in order to see our reflection, we need to do a little bit of perspective thinking about what success means for us as Scrum Masters. And that's what we do here every Thursday. <laughs> And uh, this Thursday, Kier, we want your perspective. What does success mean for you as a Scrum Master? I guess, in a sense, this, um, again, comes back to some of the issues I raised yesterday. Um, so a successful outcome for a Scrum Master is that other people understand the need to make change and are act upon, uh, ultimately are acting upon it independently. Um, there are people actively doing something, ultimately. Um, whatever that something is, it's probably something you can measure as well. Um, so ultimately, that's it's a re this is a really interesting question. Um, as the discussion of what is a measure and what can be measured can be controversial in itself, when really it doesn't need to be. Um, and this might sound a little circular, but you can me measure anything you define to be measurable. And you can define the things you measure by what you want to achieve or, or potentially what you want to move away from. Um, I guess, take an example, if you're looking to understand whether everyone understands the bigger aim of your product, you could ask a different person associated with your product, developers, stakeholders, what the product goal is every other day and measure the ratio of correct answers. That, that's a measure. The higher the ratio, the more indication you have that people know where you're going and what your aim is. Um, is it perfect? No. Um, you could be abused of people gaming their behavior because they work out that you're asking. Um, but we're, you, you kind of arguably get into the physics observer effect of being unable to measure something. Without and you can always it. measure something else. Like you don't need to Indeed. stick to the same metric forever, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, guess, I guess in that context, the argument is so what? Um, people might change their behavior to be more aware of the goal that you'd agree to align around. And that's that's a good thing. Um, so if that helps to prompt people to have a conversation about what the goal is and why it's there and how it can create alignment and focus in the team, then that feels like a success. Absolutely. And and if it if it doesn't, then you just move on. Like that's the point with metrics, right? Like if you if you start measuring something and you you, you finally realize that it doesn't help us uh, measure success, then you just move on. And and that is another piece of feedback. And having metrics allows you to collect feedback that you're not expecting to get. Like, for example, the metric doesn't move. Oh, wait, but I thought it would move. Okay, so there must be something wrong here, right? Yeah, and so ultimately, what all we're after is relevant measures. So measures that are in tune with what we're trying to achieve. It doesn't matter what those measures are. We can, we can, we can create and, and understand them and agree on them. Um, if, if I'm seeing a lack of engagement in events, people dropping out or not attending things, then you can demonstrate that through a whole series of measures. But ultimately, it's not the measures that are important. It's what they're indicators of. Um, they're indicators of things you're either looking to solve or you're looking to solve for. Yeah, absolutely. Now, wh when you think about that in your own personal reflection, right? So we have the let's call it the high level framework here, right? Like define a metric, measure it, learn from it, and then move on, do something else. But when you think about your own success gear, like how do you go about it? Like what, what, what is your routine to evaluate your own work and uh, impact as a scrum master? I think um, what I tend to do is, 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 um, is un understand and observe first um, and look for things that, that I, I feel a uh a wrong or or just just feel off um and then i start to think about well what might be the reasons for those things being off um what are they what are, what are those things telling me what are those behaviors telling me um and would i would i like to am i worried that i'm seeing this or am i worried that i'm seeing that should i be seeing le less of that or more of that um because then that you can get into the just the sort of why conversations of okay, what's what's inherently under this that's causing these behaviours? What's what's the thing that's informing those behaviours? Um, and start to think about that. And ultimately, that leads you down a tunnel of okay, well, let's 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 see um, what the real problem is. Let's understand and talk to people and understand what 
what's really here. I'd rather deal with the cause rather than the symptoms. The symptoms can help me and the symptoms can be measurable, but ultimately they're telling me there's something there that I can investigate. Um, but equally, those symptoms, if I believe I've got a solution, if I believe I've got something that I can put in place that's going to to solve the problem, then I can then use those symptoms to see if there is, is fewer of them, see so if they've, in, they've changed. In, in other words, it's like uh, don't necessarily be afraid of the symptoms, but just be aware that uh, measuring symptoms might be the beginning of a deeper reflection. Uh, and, and you might discover that certain things don't actually tell you if you're improving and then you need to start measuring others. Ab absolutely. Yeah. They, they, they won't, they won't necessarily, they can, te they can, um, you can come back to them. They may tell you that you've solved the problem, but they might, it's, it's highly unlikely the, the metric or the measure itself is going to tell you the problem. It's, it's mm. a starting point. Yeah, it's a starting point. I think that's a great way to put it. Uh, thank you for sharing all of those lessons, Kier. No worries. That's thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the last day now. It's already tomorrow, folks. Part of a successful Scrum Master job is to help the product owner. Tomorrow we explore that critical role in Scrum, the product owner role. Tune in to learn about product owner anti-patterns, what you can do to help the product owner, and a real-life example of what a great product owner is and what made it so, tomorrow on our Friday Product Owner episode. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring. <laughs>